The decaying room was dark and silent. The smell was unbearable. When he turned on the light, the image hit him head on. Among the dirty walls, on a messy wooden bed, there was what seemed to be a motionless child. Avoiding being overwhelmed by horror, the journalist and documentary filmmaker living in Great Britain, Kate Blewett, began to unwrap that quiet body. She unfolded the yellow blanket and saw a handful of bones with eyes. Pus-filled eyes full of crusts and wide open, in a gaze of surrender devoid of any hope. Eyes that illuminated the idea that this little person had never been loved, cradled, or comforted. Eyes that knew all too well that crying was of no use. When he finished undressing him, he confirmed it. She was a girl, like almost all the other children in Chinese orphanages. She just shook her head from side to side without making any sound. Her skinny legs and ribs that were almost sticking out indicated fatal malnutrition. Her name was Mei Ming, which is said to mean nameless in Chinese, and her uncertain age was more than one, two years. Mei Ming was alone in that dark space, not having been fed or cared for in ten days. She was waiting for the kiss of death, and four days later, due to starvation, her life faded away in that infamous room where she had been abandoned. In today's video, I'm going to tell you about the rooms of suffering, life in Chinese orphanages. After a year of hearing rumors about the atrocities that were allegedly happening in Chinese orphanages, where babies and children with disabilities of any gender were left to die. A team made up of three documentarians set off to that country with a mission to verify if this was true and try to document the horror. To certify this, Kate Bluett, Brian Woods, and Peter Hugh traveled thousands of kilometers across China, pretending to be workers from American orphanages. They arrived in the Asian giant separately. Each one carried pieces of cameras with wide angles with which they would film the documentary. They had to avoid being discovered. Once inside China, they gathered and assembled their hidden cameras. They knew they ran the risk of going to jail to protect the Chinese citizens who collaborated with them. Neither their faces nor their names were disclosed. And to visit the orphanages, they operated under false names and with official permits made by the centers themselves. For precaution, they also did not identify the hospices they visited. Meanwhile, at each establishment they arrived at, they were recording everything. And what they saw and recorded was something atrocious. On June 12, 95, the documentary film of almost 38 minutes, which they titled The Rooms of Death, produced by Lauderdale Productions, was broadcast by the British Channel 4 and dedicated to memeing and all the memings who went through the same thing. The images managed to awaken the world to what was happening with these discarded children in China. Let me tell you what they saw. Cameras captured dozens of babies tied, their wrists to the armrests and their ankles to the legs of the high bamboo chairs, for hours and hours. Underneath the rows of chairs was a line of plastic buckets placed right at seat height. Their function was to collect the urine and feces that fell from the hole they had in place. The babies had very short hair and were dressed in unisex clothing. No one touched them or spoke to them. In the footage, you can see a small child who can already walk by himself going over to where a baby is sitting. He forcefully hits his head against hers over and over again. Neither of them says anything and they don't even cry. An orphanage employee recounts that the previous summer, with temperatures of 37 degrees 20% or perhaps more, had died because the sums and subtractions never add up exactly in these places. The question here was, where were the missing babies? Well, no one knew this. Kate wanted to know the sex of the inpatients. Whenever she could, she would undress them and confirm their gender. It was not an easy task. It was very cold, and they were covered from head to toe with thick blankets and wrapped in several layers of clothing. All those he was able to check turned out to be women. The males they found, on the other hand, were children with disabilities. In the hospices visited, 
dirty and starving babies made up the absolute majority. They were thrown in their cribs with bottles that were not held by a mother, a caregiver, or any human being. In reality, they were propped up on some pile of something. If the nipple accidentally came out of the baby's mouth because it moved, no one was going to take care of putting it back in its place. Children crawled through the hallways with no hygiene whatsoever. There were also no adults supervising. In one sequence, a woman is seen in a neighborhood. A woman squatting, bathing a baby as if it were a rag doll. She shakes them from side to side and squeezes the naked child between her thighs and elbows so that he doesn't land on the icy floor while he's draining onto a towel. To try to explain how we got to this situation and why these tremendous events occurred, we must go back years and to Chinese policies to prevent the inequalities and overpopulation and avoid the dreaded famines. And with this, let's move on to the one-child policy. Chaos and hunger came to China with the failed economic, social, and political plan called the Great Leap Forward. Between the years of 58 and 61, the goal of the plan was collectivization, the destruction of private property, and building a new economy. Transformation of the traditional agrarian economy towards rapid industrialization. But the formula failed spectacularly. During that period, it was estimated that between 15 and 55 million people died as a result of the severe food shortage among Chinese peasants. It was the worst famine in history. While the population declined in 1961 as a result of these events, from 1963 to 66, the authorities resumed some of the measures to control population growth. It was then that they began to form the so-called late marriages and managed to halve the birth rate. From 66, a socio-political movement was generated called the Great Cultural Revolution, initiated by the leader of the Chinese Communist Party Mao Zedong, and the goal was to preserve Chinese communism by liquidating capitalist remnants. In the year 72, the Chinese Communist Party decided that it was a matter of national priority to limit births. In the year 72, the Chinese Communist Party decided that it was a matter of national priority to limit births. It began to exert much more pressure and to massively distribute contraceptives among the inhabitants. They feared an imminent population explosion. By the middle of that decade, they imposed controls on the number of children each family could have. In urban areas, two were recommended in rural areas between three and four. That didn't seem to work either. The authorities were saying that if this was not corrected, the country would become unsustainable. They wouldn't be able to have development or modernization programs. The population had to be stabilized by the year 2000 with a maximum of 1.2 billion inhabitants. But the population was already reaching 1 billion and previous programs had not yielded results. They predicted that it would come about in the middle of the next millennium. Most of the inhabitants ran out of food. Most of the inhabitants ran out of food. So it was that in 79, the crucial decision was reached. The supreme leader was now Deng Xiaoping, and he was the one who took a drastic and controversial measure. The one-child policy. No one could have more than one throughout the country, except for ethnic minorities. And above all, the rule had to be complied with no matter what. They were convinced that with these measures, they would alleviate the serious social and environmental problems. Anything could happen to parents who did not respect this rule. They could be fined, have their power cut off. The father could be imprisoned to ensure the pregnant woman had an abortion. The woman could be sterilized, their newborn could be taken away, and even they could be given a lethal injection. They also encouraged the decision. Neighbors had to report if they knew someone was breaking the law. And with this, terror reigned. Instead, couples with only one child received the glorious, in quotes, special certification. They had benefits such as a longer maternity leave, a priority housing allocation, and they obtained financial aid. Starting in the 80s, controls loosened a bit in rural areas. Unfortunately, in a way, if the first child was a girl or a baby with a disability, they were allowed to have a second baby with a prior procedure that certified that all of this was strictly true. The strict one-child policy resulted in parents, especially in rural areas, 
seeing it as a real misfortune to have a daughter or a child with health problems. They needed strong hands to work the field, and their retirement depended on that only male child they could have. Faced with this reality, many chose to abandon those babies who did not guarantee their future, who were newborns with problems or of the female gender. Selective abortion was also practiced. Obviously the most desired good was a healthy male child. Babies who came into the world without meeting the requirements, if they were lucky, ended up in an orphanage. That this luck thing is not entirely true. The rest were discarded. Some were drowned in their own homes. Others were thrown into a watercourse, a sewer, toilets, or a garbage dump. At least in orphanages there was a minimal chance of survival, although the mortality rate was extremely high. But returning to the documentary, directed by Blewett and Woods with Hugh as cameraman, the documentary film won the Peabody Award and the Emmy in its category among many other awards. As soon as it became known in 95, the scandal took off and was repudiated by the Chinese government who said that Blewett had made everything up. The regime had a film made counter-documentary which it called Patchwork of Lies. It was claimed there that everything had been fabricated by the journalists. In this recording, the government showed another side of the orphanages and social policies. They said that some worked very well and others had a lower standard due to obvious economic difficulties. Some of the heads of the orphanages visited spoke in this new Chinese documentary. A director explained that, for example, the tied-up boys had severe disabilities and that to prevent them from hurting themselves or others, they were restrained, if you can call it that. And besides, she clarified that they didn't have staff to be with each of them 24 hours a day. However, not everyone was so critical of China. On one hand, two Irish people involved in charity work who traveled to that country to visit orphanages argued that the British documentary had been exaggerated. Rick Taylor, a writer and former chief correspondent for the prestigious newspaper The New York Times, wrote an article on January 21, 96 called In China's Orphanages, A War of Perceptions. There he stated that the government's refutation did not serve to justify the abysmal conditions in which the children were found the day the filming crew gathered. For his part, Walter Goodman, also a writer and American journalist for the newspaper, argued that Kate Blewett, Brian Woods, and Peter Hugh did not make a balanced documentary. But more important than highlighting that is to say that they managed to arouse international concern about the fate of those children they show there. However, many of those children had already joined the countless anonymous graves. On the other hand, a study conducted by the University of California in 2007 showed that the one-child policy, analyzed from a demographic point of view, had been useful, especially if it was considered that it had prevented epidemics, prevented thousands of precarious settlements, prevented health systems from collapsing, helped to produce less waste and contributed to less over-exploitation of fertile lands. It is believed that this measure prevented between 300 and 400 million births but that number, like many other things related to data in China, is highly disputed. However, other subsequent demographic studies showed the flip side, a progressive aging. The Chinese population was aging, even in some areas the growth was negative, that was not good either. In 2013, the authorities relaxed the birth policy a bit, and by 2015, China decided to reverse its birth control because they discovered that their birth rate was one of the lowest in the world. The ideal rate to achieve a generational replacement should be 2.1 births per woman and China had 1.5. If the calculations were correct, by 2050 a quarter of its population would be over 65 years old there would be far fewer inhabitants working and many more retirees to support. The dangerous aging of its population was key to putting a break on the one-child policy. The new provisions then opened the possibility of two children per couple. But a few days ago, as of when I'm recording this, 
China now allows three children to stimulate birth rates. On the other hand, in China, abortion has been legal and free since 1975 when it was considered another method to stabilize the number of inhabitants. Currently, between 8 and 10 million abortions per year are registered. What was prohibited was selective abortion and prenatal studies to know the sex. Either way, about 100,000 children with health problems are abandoned each year. Although in China, abandoning a baby is a crime that receives sentences of up to five years in prison, it is something that continues to happen. The founder of the Beijing Angel Mom Charity Foundation says that generally, the parents of these abandoned babies are good people who feel helpless and hopeless about being able to raise the children themselves. They believe that this way they will find a better life with another family. And she acknowledges that while this has greatly improved in today's China, this is why the government implemented the hatcheries, which are small structures with incubators and without cameras mounted near hospitals, to abandon newborns in a way that is safe for their lives and allows the parents to remain anonymous. By the end of 2014, they had more than 25 hatcheries throughout China. In just 11 days, a network of hatcheries in one province became historically significant. This single hatchery received 106 babies. This is roughly to give you an idea. But yes, it's clear that children in China don't have an easy life. Also, the educational demand on them tends to be high. That's why this year a new law is waiting to be approved in Congress. It will prohibit parents from using physical or psychological violence to teach kids how to behave. And this would indeed be a good step forward. It is estimated that today in China there are about 600,000 children living in orphanages. 98% of them suffer from various disabilities, disorders, or diseases. Finally, it's been 25 years since that documentary that shook the planet. And if she had survived, Mei Ming would be 27 years old today. Her short and unfair life made visible a drama that was lived or continues to be lived in that country. If you like this video, don't forget to follow me on my social networks and on my secondary channel as Sabi Esqueva and Pepe Mysterio. My name is Pepe Cherecero and this is... Pepe Mysterio.